a field or method in Java can be declared to be static. Static in this context has nothing to do with static typing, nor is this use of static like the use of static in C. In Java, static has a totally different meaning. In Java, when a field is declared static, the instances of its class do not each have their own instance of that field. So here, for example, in the class Ian, we have a static field F of type Fran. Well, when we instantiate Ian, each Ian object doesn't have its own field F. The truth is that the field F is really just a global variable, and is a global variable which we happened to put inside the class Ian. The only real relationship between this global variable and the class is that the class effectively acts as a namespace. So when we want to refer to this global variable, we refer to it as Ian.F. Similarly, a static method is really not a method at all. It's not really a part of the class. Consequently, you can't invoke this method via an instance. That doesn't make any sense. And inside the method, you can't use this, because there is no object on which the method was invoked. So in truth, a static method is just a plain old function, and its only relationship to the class is that the class acts as its namespace. So here, if the class Ian has a static method named foo, well, to invoke foo, we would write ian.foo. In a way, static fields and static methods in Java are really kind of a cheat. Java is supposed to be a very object-oriented language, but any time you deal with global variables and plain functions rather than methods, you're not really programming in an object-oriented style. Still, it is good that Java has static fields and methods, because not all problems neatly fit into the object-oriented mold. It's sometimes nice if we can fall back on a procedural way of doing things. Now unfortunately with statics, Java allows something which is not only superfluous, but stupidly confusing to newbies. Here in this code, it appears that we are invoking the static method foo via an instance i, and that we are accessing the static field f via the instance i. But what's actually happening here is that the compiler merely looks at the compile time type of i and determines that yes, that type has a static method foo and so we can invoke it. It's really just an alternative to writing ian.foo and the invocation here has nothing to do with the instance of ian. It's really just a plain old call to the static method. And the assignment to f again has nothing to do with the instance. We're just assigning to the global variable and there's only one global variable no matter how many instances of ian we have. It's just as a convenience, a misguided convenience, I believe, that Java allows us to refer to a static using any object expression that has the right compile time type. In my opinion, there's no reason you should ever do this, so I would always write ian.foo and ian.f. I think allowing static methods to be invoked this way is particularly confusing because it raises the question of, does it matter what the actual type at runtime in i is? because methods can be overridden, and so with instance methods, with non-static methods, it really does matter what is an i. But with static methods, the runtime type never matters. All that matters is the compile time type of the object expression. And so here, because the compile time type of i is ian, this invocation is always going to invoke the static of ian, even if a subclass of ian has overridden foo. That's never going to matter here, because static methods just don't work that way. In fact, I would say that the proper way to think about overriding of static methods is that the override is really just a totally separate function. They really have no relationship with each other, they just happen to share the same name. And so now we actually have a fifth rule of how methods are invoked. When a static method is invoked, which version gets called depends solely on what the compile time type of the object expression is. Again, not that you should rely on this rule. You should always explicitly invoke statics via their class name. Every reference type, every class and every interface, is placed in a namespace called a package. At the top of every file of source code, you put a package statement that declares that all the classes and all the interfaces in this file belong to this package. So, for example, if at the top of a file you have the line package shark, then all of the classes and all of the interfaces in that file are placed in the package of that name, shark. 
Package names by convention begin with lowercase letters, and they conform to all the rules of identifiers, except package names can include dots in the middle. So say, you might have a package named pig.tiger. In truth, though, when you use dots in a package name, Java considers it actually to be a sub-package. So here this is actually tiger, the sub-package of pig. However, the term sub-package is misleading because there's nothing really special going on here. The classes that you place in pig.tiger have really no necessary relationship with anything you put in the package pig. In fact, if you put stuff in the package pig.tiger, you don't even have to have anything in a package named pig. At most, you should think of these sub-packages like subdirectories. When a directory contains another directory, the files in that subdirectory have no necessary relationship with the stuff in the outer directory, though of course how you organize your files into directories and subdirectories should be logical. Well, of course, the same applies to packages. How you organize your classes and interfaces into packages should be logical. Now, say we're writing code in a source file, which is declared to use the package pig.tiger. So all the classes and interfaces defined in that file are going to become a part of that package pig.tiger. Well, when writing code in this file, if we wish to make use of classes and interfaces from some other package, something other than pig.tiger, we have to fully qualify their names with the package name. So, for example, if the class ant is defined in the package shark, well then we can't just refer to ant simply by the name ant, we have to refer to it as shark.ant. Then conversely, when in a file declared to be part of the package shark, we don't have to qualify ant by its package name, but we do have to qualify the name of any class or interface which doesn't belong to shark. So say any time we need to use the name of the class cow, which is defined in the package pig.tiger, we have to write pig.tiger.cow. We can't just write cow. Having to always fully qualify any class or interface from other packages gets obnoxious quite quickly. Not only does it require us to type more, it just makes the code end up looking really ugly and verbose. So, at the top of any source file, after the package statement, you can include any number of import statements. So here we're importing the classes pig.tiger.cow and pig.tiger.lemur. These statements don't represent any sort of runtime action, it's just telling the compiler that in this file, this class or interface name from some other package doesn't have to be qualified. So now in this file, we can just write lemur to refer to the class lemur from pig.tiger, and we can write just cow to refer to the class cow from the package pig.tiger. The general practice is to always try and avoid qualifying names, and so we just import whenever we can. The only reason not to import is that you might have a name conflict. Like say, if the package shark had its own class named cow, then importing the class cow from another package creates a name collision. If shark does have its own class cow, then cow here is going to refer to shark.cow. The compiler's simply going to ignore the imports of pig.tiger.cow, so to use that class, we'd have to qualify it with its package name. 